So we're going to solve this. So step one, rewrite the left side with that differential operator. So it's going to be a degree two operator here. So write that operator out, and then see if you can factor that. So any questions or discrepancies? So writing it out as two linear operators. All right, what we're going to do is group up the in, everything except the outermost operator. Now in this case, there's only two things. But if we were doing three or four operators, we'd group up all those except the outside. So we'll let u equal d plus 1 y. <coughs> and then rewrite our equation with u. Now we're going to apply the operator and solve for u. So I'll solve this for u and then we'll plug it back in. Try to use your cheat sheet instead of your notes from yesterday if possible. Unless your notes or your cheat sheet has got none of this on it. But I'm looking for my Bernoulli stuff. If you're looking for your Bernoulli stuff, I recommend look on your cheat sheet. And if you can't find your cheat sheet, that means your cheat sheet needs to be updated.
So any Bernoulli questions? I was probably a little quick with some of my algebra steps. That's good. Oh, so <clears throat> antiderivative e to the ax, regardless of what a is, is e to the ax divided by a. So you don't want to think more about it than that. What's in parentheses there is a. It's just a complex number. There's a little funkiness I did with the you know the powers where I added two x plus ix and I just brought the constant out front. So you're talking about going from here to the, uh, the step below it to the step. So that to that. Uh, yes. So on the so I I integrated both sides, but I also did the anti product rule, oh, okay. which feels really clever the first eight times you do it, and then by the ninth time it's not very exciting anymore. Um, and and I, Bernoulli, I believe, always ends up with this working. Okay. So when you make your Bernoulli, uh, when you multiply by your Bernoulli integrating factor, and then it will turn into, it'll factor, oh, well, you, you can apply the anti-product rule okay. like this. So it, it's not like some neat surprise is what should happen. Okay. It'll still feel neat, but uh, it's, it's no longer exciting. Because it's what, it's what should be happening. All right, so we got the U. We're going to bring that back up here. Oh, look at that. Perfect arrow. So I'm going to rewrite that U up here. So we got E to the, I'm going to write it as 1 over 2 plus I, E to the IX plus C, E to the negative 2X. And just like a U sub, this is basically an analog, uh, similar to having a U sub. Uh, because we weren't clever enough to figure it out without bringing in some U variable, we have to unbring in that U variable. So we used U temporarily to figure this one out, and now we're putting back in the, uh, our result. So from here, we really have a degree one differential equation. So go ahead and solve this degree one. Your Q of X is just a little more complicated, that's all. And that's the only thing that really changed. You should still have a Bernoulli. Your Q of X is just a little bit uglier. And it might be nicer to swap the sides. So right as Y prime plus Y equals this function here. So I skipped the Bernoulli step of computing that my integrating factor is e to the x. So you can definitely do that. <coughs> if you realize that the coefficient of the uh, y function is 1, so you're going to integrate 1, and you'll get x, and it's just e to that integral. So 
So integral cancels derivative, and then the right side should be pretty easy. Just divide by that power. get a second constant. So let's go ahead and write our first constant as C1 and our second as C2. And last up, just get the e to the x out. So multiply by e to the negative x. So that will be 2 plus i, 1 plus i, e to the i x minus C1 e to the minus 2 x plus C2e to the minus x. So we see our, that's our yp, plus both of these are the homogeneous solutions. So our homogeneous comes out with the undetermined coefficients, and our particular comes out with a fixed uh, coefficient. So you can probably go back and solve some of your quizzes like this too if you wanted to. So you've seen the ones with constants that's our yc? Yes. Okay. And you should have the exact number of constants as your degree. Right. So we had degree 2, so I was expecting two constants to show up. Um, and if you look, our linear independence gets a little weird with complex numbers, but basically I think we, I don't really want to flip back to that page, but if you wanted to go back to um, like the finding it uh, linear independent, I think as long as your <coughs> value in front, your a value is different, you were linearly independent. I think we showed that, and that would be true for complex numbers as well. So i is not negative 2, i is not negative 1. So that's already independent right there. So back somewhere around 20 or 21, we looked at e to the ax. I think we used p and q. And it depend on when, exactly when p is not q. As long as the coefficient of x is not i, negative 2, or negative 1, you're good. So it can be any other number, real or complex, other than those three. So even if it was like positive 1, still it, it would still be independent from e to the negative x. So I will uh, do my best to find some web work problems after class to post up on uh, online. But in my notes here, uh, I recommend this is a lot of new uh, techniques. So the actual uh, ODE problems are 19 through 38. So I would recommend doing enough of those. I don't want to. I don't know how many is enough. Depends on who you are. Uh, and the ones before 19, so I had written down start on number 13. So on 13, you can apply, and actually there's a few you can do that before. Right, looks like you start right around 10. Uh, these are applying the different theorem and corollary that we developed, so the exponential shift theorem and the corollaries. So apply the exponential shift theorem and corollaries. 
you can just write down the exponential shift theorem and the corollaries are just special versions of that. So you can always just write the exponential shift theory and just apply that every time instead of trying to pick which of the three you should use. So exponential shift theory will work all the time. It just might be a little more overkill. And this is on page 266, 267. Oh, that worked. Okay, inverse operators, here we go. So we looked at linear polynomial operators and what we're about to do is invert them. So in this section, when we write We only care about the particular solution. <coughs> so we're going to ignore or just uh, let yc equal zero. So we'll just pick the zero coefficients. So remember, yc had co uh, constant coefficients, so we're just going to let them be 0 and not worry about that. So normally, the full solution is yp plus yc, and we're just saying forget about the yc part. Inverse operators, algebraically, it makes sense to write P inverse D. What would be your first guess at how to write P inverse D if you knew what P of D was? Just be completely naive. D1 over D? Well, almost, 1 over P of D. So algebraically, we'll write it like this. We'll write it as it's a reciprocal. This makes a little sense because if you apply two operators, how do you apply two operators in a row? How do they interact? They multiply together. So if you wanted to go an operator multiplied by its inverse operator, it should cancel out. And if you think how they're applied, they're applied with multiplication. So it makes sense to unapply them or apply their inverses with division. So algebraically, that's how we're going to treat them, as if they are reciprocals or division instead of multiplication. And of course, if you write it with notation, inverse notation, you could also write it like that, where you bring your negative, uh, your inverse power out here. So this is one of the very few times that an inverse operator is also the reciprocal. That in general doesn't happen. So that's algebraically. Functionally, I want to say the word calculistically, but as it applies to calculus, the way you're actually going to apply it as an operator, not as the algebraic properties of when you're combining with other operators, but how you actually apply it functionally. So this is an operator. So how do I, the analog in the good old days, 
it looked like this. You had f inverse x equal y. How do you get f on the other side? How do I get that f inverse away from the x? So if I want to solve for x, what do I do? So I want to get x by itself, so I f both sides. So I want to move my function out of the way, so I invert it, and it will jump to the other side. Oops, so it will look like x equals f of y. So that's what it means to invert a function. That's all we're doing. The notation's different, but not by that much. So what I underlined is the, in the inverse function. So that chunk is going to move the other side as just regular p of d. So this is the same as q of x equals pd of that y function. So we're going to move the operator to the other side by inverting it. Oh yeah, that th this p is attached to the y. Maybe I just won't even write it. So it's just the whatever your <laughs> y function is. And there's so I just underlined the part that actually jumped to the other side as its inverse. And that should feel exactly like functions. Take take an inverse function brings a function to the other side. Now, when are you allowed to? say a function has an inverse. When does a function have an inverse? It's one to one. When it's one to one. So let's do a computation. So our first example. So here's the problem. Find this inverse operator of x. Did we start with an equation? No. Oh, man. <coughs> so what if I asked you a pre-calculus question? Because it's Friday, and I want to ask you easy questions so we can build confidence. So what if I asked you, uh, what is sine of inverse of 1 half? You might be able to just tell me right off the top of your head. But let's say you didn't. How, what's one way you could figure this out using what you know about the regular sine function? So we just create some variable out of the thin air, which is we use theta. You can use any letter you want, other than probably s and i and n. But any other letter. So what we'll do is let, normally I would say let theta equal sine inverse. doesn't matter what side we write it on. So we'll let theta equal sine inverse. And then I'm going to move the sine inverse function out of there by uh, writing a sine on the other side. And then you can use what you know about sine to hopefully figure out what theta is. So we're going to do that exact process with the operator. So I'm going to let, well, write on the next line here. And I'll use the letter y. We've been writing with x's and y's. No reason to go theta here. So we're going to move the operator to the other side. And all that happens is the little inverse gets erased. So we're going to move it to the other side. So that's the same as x equals d squared minus 3d plus 2 y. Any questions on moving it to the other side? We don't really know how to apply the inverse operator, so we're just using the fact that we know that it's the inverse, something we do know how to apply. So we're pretty much avoiding computing it by computing the inverse. Uh, now at the end, <coughs> I'm going to have y equal, uh, x equals a function of y, 
y is something I made up. So my goal is to find y now. So I'll write that down. Well, I should write solve for y.